Book Three, Chapter One, Part Two of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Three, Chapter One A Matter of Civilization. Part Two of Two. Defeat. March in the country around was rare with jasmine and jonquils and patches of violets in the warming grass. Afterward, he remembered especially one afternoon of such a fresh and magic glamour that, as he stood in the rifle pit marking targets, he recited Atlanta in Caledon to an uncomprehending pole, his voice mingling with the rip, sing, and splatter of bullets overhead. When the hounds of spring, spang, are on winter's traces, were the mother of months, hey, come to, mark three. In town, the streets were in a sleepy dream again, and together Anthony and Dot idled in their own tracks of the previous autumn, until he began to feel a drowsy attachment for this south, a south, it seemed, more of Algiers than of Italy, with faded aspirations pointing back over innumerable generations, to some warm, primitive nirvana without hope or care. Here there was an inflection of cordiality, of comprehension, in every voice. Life plays the same lovely and agonizing joke on all of us, they seemed to say in their plaintive, pleasant cadence, in the rising inflection terminating on an unresolved minor. He liked his barber shop, where he was, Hi, Corporal! to a pale, emaciated young man who shaved him and pushed a cool, vibrating machine endlessly over his insatiable head. He liked Johnston's Gardens, where they danced, where a tragic negro made yearning, aching music on a saxophone until the garish hall became an enchanted jungle of barbaric rhythms and smoky laughter, where to forget the uneventful passage of time upon Dorothy's soft sighs and tender whisperings was the consummation of all aspiration, of all content. There was an undertone of sadness in her character, a conscious evasion of all except the pleasurable minutiae of life. Her violet eyes would remain for hours apparently insensate, as, thoughtful and reckless, she basked like a cat in the sun. He wondered what the tired, spiritless mother thought of them, and whether in her moments of uttermost cynicism she ever guessed at their relationship. On Sunday afternoons they walked along the countryside, resting at intervals on the dry moss in the outskirts of a wood. Here the birds had gathered, and the clusters of violets in white dogwood. Here the hoar-trees shone crystalline and cool, oblivious to the intoxicating heat that waited outside. Here he would talk, intermittently, in a sleepy monologue, in a conversation of no significance, of no replies. July came scorching down. Captain Dunning was ordered to detail one of his men to learn blacksmithing. The regiment was filling up to war strength, and he needed most of his veterans for drill masters, so he selected the little Italian, Baptiste, whom he could most easily spare. Little Baptiste had never had anything to do with horses. His fear made matters worse. He reappeared in the orderly room one day and told Captain Dunning that he wanted to die if he couldn't be relieved. The horses kicked at him, he said. He was no good at the work. Finally, he fell on his knees and besought Captain Dunning, in a mixture of broken English and scriptural Italian, to get him out of it. He had not slept for three days. Monstrous stallions reared and cavorted through his dreams. Captain Dunning reproved the company clerk, who had burst out laughing, and told Baptiste he would do what he could. But when he thought it over, he decided that he couldn't spare a better man. Little Baptiste went from bad to worse. The horses seemed to divine his fear and take every advantage of it. Two weeks later a great black mare crushed his skull in with her hoofs while he was trying to lead her from her stall. In mid-July came rumors, and then orders, that concerned a change of camp. The brigade was to move to an empty cantonment a hundred miles farther south, there to be expanded into a division. At first the men thought they were departing for the trenches, and all evening little groups jabbered in the company street, 
shouting to each other in swaggering exclamations, "'Sure we are!' When the truth leaked out, it was rejected indignantly as a blind to conceal their real destination. They reveled in their own importance. That night they told their girls in town that they were going to get the Germans. Anthony circulated for a while among the groups, then, stopping a jitney, rode down to tell Dot that he was going away. She was waiting on the dark veranda in a cheap white dress that accentuated the youth and softness of her face. Oh, she whispered, I've wanted you so, honey, all this day. I have something to tell you. She drew him down beside her on the swinging seat, not noticing his ominous tone. Tell me. We're leaving next week. Her arms, seeking his shoulders, remained poised upon the dark air, her chin tipped up. When she spoke, the softness was gone from her voice. Leaving for France? No, less luck than that leaving for some darn camp in Mississippi. She shut her eyes, and he could see that the lids were trembling. Dear little Dot, life is so damned hard. She was crying upon his shoulder. So damned hard, he repeated aimlessly. So damned hard. It just hurts people and hurts people until finally it hurts them so that they can't be hurt ever any more. That's the last and worst thing it does. Frantic, wild with anguish, she strained him to her breast. Oh, God, she whispered brokenly, you can't go away from me. I'd die. He was finding it impossible now to pass off his departure as a common, impersonal blow. He was too near to her to do more than repeat, poor little Dot, poor little Dot. And then what? she demanded wearily. What do you mean? You're my whole life, that's all. I'd die for you right now if you said so. I'd get a knife and kill myself. You can't leave me here. Her tone frightened him. These things happen, he said evenly. Then I'm going with you. Tears were streaming down her cheeks. Her mouth was trembling in an ecstasy of grief and fear. Sweet, he muttered sentimentally. Sweet little girl. Don't you see we'd just be putting off what's bound to happen? I'll be going to France in a few months. She leaned away from him and, clinching her fists, lifted her face toward the sky. "'I want to die,' she said, as if molding each word carefully in her heart. "'Dot,' he whispered uncomfortably, "'you'll forget. Things are sweeter when they're lost. I know, because once I wanted something and got it. It was the only thing I ever wanted badly, Dot, and when I got it it turned to dust in my hands.' "'All right.' Absorbed in himself, he continued, I've often thought that if I hadn't got what I wanted, things might have been different with me. I might have found something in my mind and enjoyed putting it in circulation. I might have been content with the work of it and had some sweet vanity out of the success. I suppose that at one time I could have had anything I wanted within reason, but that was the only thing I ever wanted with any fervor. God! And that taught me you can't have anything, you can't have anything at all, because desire just cheats you. It's like a sunbeam skipping here and there about a room. It stops and gilds some inconsequential object, and we poor fools try to grasp it. But when we do, the sunbeam moves on to something else, and you've got the inconsequential part. The glitter that made you want it is gone. He broke off uneasily. She had risen and was standing, dry-eyed, picking little leaves from a dark vine. Dot. Go away, she said coldly. What? Why? I don't want just words. If that's all you have for me, you'd better go. Why, Dot, what's death to me is just a lot of words to you. You put them together so pretty. I'm sorry. I was talking about you, Dot. Go away from here. He approached her with arms outstretched, but she held him away. You don't want me to go with you, she said evenly, because you're going to meet that, that girl. She could not bring herself to say, wife. How do I know? Well, then, I reckon you're not my fellow any more, so go away. For a moment, while conflicting warnings and desires prompted Anthony, it seemed one of those rare times when he would take a step prompted from within. He hesitated. Then a wave of weariness broke against him. It was too late. Everything was too late. 
For years now he had dreamed the world away, basing his decisions upon emotions unstable as water. The little girl in the white dress dominated him as she approached beauty in the hard symmetry of her desire. The fire blazing in her dark and injured heart seemed to glow around her like a flame. With some profound and uncharted pride she had made herself remote and so achieved her purpose. I didn't mean to seem so callous, Dot. It don't matter. The fire rolled over Anthony. Something wrenched at his bowels, and he stood there, helpless and beaten. Come with me, Dot, little loving Dot. Oh, come with me. I couldn't leave you now. With a sob she wound her arms around him and let him support her weight while the moon, at its perennial labor of covering the bad complexion of the world, showed its illicit honey over the drowsy street. THE CATASTROPHE Early September in Camp Boone, Mississippi. The darkness, alive with insects, beat in upon the mosquito netting, beneath the shelter of which Anthony was trying to write a letter. An intermittent chatter over a poker game was going on in the next tent, and outside a man was strolling up the company street, singing a current bit of doggerel about k k k Katie. With an effort, Anthony hoisted himself to his elbow and, pencil in hand, looked down at his blank sheet of paper. Then, omitting any heading, he began, I can't imagine what the matter is, Gloria. I haven't had a line from you for two weeks, and it's only natural to be worried. He threw this away with a disturbed grunt and began again. I don't know what to think, Gloria. Your last letter, short, cold, without a word of affection or even a decent account of what you've been doing, came two weeks ago. It's only natural that I should wonder. If your love for me isn't absolutely dead, it seems that you'd at least keep me from worry. Again he crumpled the page and tossed it angrily through a tear in the tent wall, realizing simultaneously that he would have to pick it up in the morning. He felt disinclined to try again. He could get no warmth into the lines, only a persistent jealousy and suspicion. Since midsummer, these discrepancies in Gloria's correspondence had grown more and more noticeable. At first he had scarcely perceived them. He was so inured to the perfunctory dearest and darlings scattered through her letters that he was oblivious to their presence or absence. But in this last fortnight he had become increasingly aware that there was something amiss. He had sent her a night letter saying that he had passed his examinations for an officer's training camp and expected to leave for Georgia shortly. She had not answered. He had wired again. When he received no word, he imagined that she might be out of town. But it occurred and recurred to him that she was not out of town, and a series of distraught imaginings began to plague him. Supposing Gloria, bored and restless, had found someone, even as he had, the thought terrified him with its possibility. It was chiefly because he had been so sure of her personal integrity that he had considered her so sparingly during the year. And now, as a doubt was born, the old angers, the rages of possession, swarmed back a thousandfold. What more natural than that she should be in love again? He remembered the Gloria who promised that, should she ever want anything, she would take it, insisting that, since she would act entirely for her own satisfaction, she could go through such an affair unsmirched. It was only the effect on a person's mind that counted, anyhow, she said, and her reaction would be the masculine one, of satiation and faint dislike. But that had been when they were first married. Later, with the discovery that she could be jealous of Anthony, she had, outwardly at least, changed her mind. There were no other men in the world for her. This he had known only too early. Perceiving that a certain fastidiousness would restrain her, he had grown lax in preserving the completeness of her love, which, after all, was the keystone of the entire structure. Meanwhile, all through the summer he had been maintaining Dot in a boarding-house downtown. To do this, it had been necessary to write to his broker for money. Dot had covered her journey south by leaving her house a day before the brigade broke camp, informing her mother in a note that she had gone to New York. On the evening following, Anthony had called as though to see her. Mrs. Raycroft was in a state of collapse, and there was a policeman in the parlor. A questionnaire had ensued, 
from which Anthony had extricated himself with some difficulty. In September, with his suspicions of Gloria, the company of Dot had become tedious, then almost intolerable. He was nervous and irritable from lack of sleep. His heart was sick and afraid. Three days ago he had gone to Captain Dunning and asked for a furlough, only to be met with benignant procrastination. The division was starting overseas, while Anthony was going to an officer's training camp. What furloughs could be given must go to the men who were leaving the country. Upon this refusal, Anthony had started to the telegraph office, intending to wire Gloria to come south. He reached the door and receded despairingly, seeing the utter impracticality of such a move. Then he had spent the evening quarreling irritably with Dot, and returned to camp morose and angry with the world. There had been a disagreeable scene, in the midst of which he had precipitately departed. What was to be done with her did not seem to concern him vitally at present. He was completely absorbed in the disheartening silence of his wife. The flap of the tent made a sudden triangle back upon itself, and a dark head appeared against the night. "'Sergeant Patch?' The accent was Italian, and Anthony saw by the belt that the man was a headquarters orderly. "'Want me?' "'Lady, call up headquarters ten minutes ago. Say she have speak with you. Very important.' Anthony swept aside the mosquito netting and stood up. It might be a wire from Gloria, telephoned over. She say to get you. She call again ten o'clock. All right, thanks. He picked up his hat, and in a moment was striding beside the orderly through the hot, almost suffocating darkness. Over in the headquarters shack, he saluted a dozing night service officer. Sit down and wait, suggested the lieutenant nonchalantly. Girl seemed awful anxious to speak to you. Anthony's hopes fell away. Thank you very much, sir and as the phone squeaked on the sidewall, he knew who was calling. "'This is Dot,' came an unsteady voice. "'I've got to see you. Dot, I told you I couldn't get down for several days. I've got to see you tonight. It's important.' "'It's too late,' he said coldly. "'It's ten o'clock, and I have to be in camp at eleven. "'All right.' There was so much wretchedness compressed into the two words that Anthony felt a measure of compunction. What's the matter? I want to tell you good-bye. Oh, don't be a little idiot, he exclaimed, but his spirits rose. What luck if she should leave town this very night! What a burden from his soul! But he said, You can't possibly leave before tomorrow. Out of the corner of his eye he saw the night service officer regarding him quizzically. Then, startlingly, came Dot's next words. I don't mean leave that way. Anthony's hand clutched the receiver fiercely. He felt his nerves turning cold, as if the heat was leaving his body. What? Then quickly, in a wild, broken voice, he heard, "'Good-bye! Oh, good-bye! Clip. She had hung up the receiver. With a sound that was half a gasp, half a cry, Anthony hurried from the headquarters building. Outside, under the stars that dripped like silver tassels through the trees of the little grove, he stood motionless, hesitating. Had she meant to kill herself? Oh, the little fool! He was filled with bitter hate toward her. In this denouement he found it impossible to realize that he had ever begun such an entanglement, such a mess, a sordid melange of worry and pain. He found himself walking slowly away, repeating over and over that it was futile to worry. He had best go back to his tent and sleep. He needed sleep. God, would he ever sleep again? His mind was in a vast clamor and confusion. As he reached the road, he turned around in a panic and began running, not toward his company, but away from it. Men were returning now. He could find a taxicab. After a minute, two yellow eyes appeared around a bend. Desperately, he ran toward them. Jitney! Jitney! It was an empty Ford. I want to go to town. Cost you a dollar. All right, if you'll just hurry. After an interminable time he ran up the steps of a dark, ramshackle little house and through the door, almost knocking over an immense negress who was walking, candle in hand, along the hall. "'Where's my wife?' he cried wildly. "'She gone to bed.' Up the stairs, three at a time, 
down the creaking passage. The room was dark and silent, and with trembling fingers he struck a match. Two wide eyes looked up at him from a wretched ball of clothes on the bed. "'Ah, I knew you'd come,' she murmured brokenly. Anthony grew cold with anger. "'So it was just a plan to get me down here, get me in trouble,' he said. "'God damn it, you've shouted wolf once too often.' She regarded him pitifully. "'I had to see you. I couldn't have lived. Oh, I had to see you.' He sat down on the side of the bed and slowly shook his head. "'You're no good,' he said decisively, talking unconsciously, as Gloria might have talked to him. "'This sort of thing isn't fair to me, you know.' "'Come closer.' Whatever he might say, Dot was happy now. He cared for her. She had brought him to her side. "'Oh, God!' said Anthony hopelessly. As weariness rolled along its inevitable wave, his anger subsided, receded, vanished. He collapsed suddenly, fell sobbing beside her on the bed. "'Oh, my darling,' she begged him, "'don't cry, oh, don't cry.' She took his head upon her breast and soothed him, mingled her happy tears with the bitterness of his. Her hand played gently with his dark hair. "'I'm such a little fool,' she murmured brokenly, "'but I love you, and when you're cold to me it seems as if it isn't worth while to go on living. After all, this was peace, the quiet room with the mingled scent of women's powder and perfume, Dot's hand soft as a warm wind upon his hair, the rise and fall of her bosom as she took breath. For a moment it was as though it were Gloria there, as though he were at rest in some sweeter and safer home than he had ever known. An hour passed. A clock began to chime in the hall. He jumped to his feet and looked at the phosphorescent hands of his wristwatch. It was twelve o'clock. He had trouble in finding a taxi that would take him out at that hour. As he urged the driver faster along the road, he speculated on the best method of entering camp. He had been late several times recently, and he knew that, were he caught again, his name would probably be stricken from the list of officer candidates. He wondered if he had better not dismiss the taxi and take a chance on passing the sentry in the dark. Still, officers often rode past the sentries after midnight. Halt! The monosyllable came from the yellow glare that the headlights dropped upon the changing road. The taxi driver threw out his clutch and a sentry walked up, carrying his rifle at the port. With him, by an ill chance, was an officer of the guard. Out late, sergeant? Yes, sir. Got delayed. Too bad. Have to take your name. As the officer waited, notebook and pencil in hand, something not fully intended crowded to Anthony's lips something born of panic, of muddle, of despair. "'Sergeant R. A. Foley,' he answered breathlessly. "'And the outfit? Company Q, 83rd Infantry.' "'All right. You'll have to walk from here, Sergeant.' Anthony saluted, quickly paid his taxi driver, and set off for a run toward the regiment he had named. When he was out of sight, he changed his course, and with his heart beating wildly, hurried to his company, feeling that he had made a fatal error of judgment. Two days later, the officer who had been in command of the guard recognized him in a barber shop downtown. In charge of a military policeman, he was taken back to the camp, where he was reduced to the ranks without trial and confined for a month to the limits of his company street. With this blow, a spell of utter depression overtook him, and within a week he was again caught downtown, wandering around in a drunken daze, with a pint of bootleg whiskey in his hip pocket. It was because of a sort of craziness in his behavior at the trial that his sentence to the guardhouse was for only three weeks. Nightmare Early in his confinement, the conviction took root in him that he was going mad. It was as though there were a quantity of dark yet vivid personalities in his mind, some of them familiar, some of them strange and terrible, held in check by a little monitor who sat aloft somewhere and looked on. The thing that worried him was that the monitor was sick and holding out with difficulty. Should he give up, should he falter for a moment, out would rush these intolerable things. Only Anthony could know what a state of blackness there would be if the worst of him could roam, his consciousness unchecked. The heat of the day had changed somehow, until it was a burnished darkness crushing down upon a devastated land. 
Over his head the blue circles of ominous uncharted suns, of unnumbered centers of fire, revolved interminably before his eyes, as though he were lying constantly exposed to the hot light, and in a state of feverish coma. At seven in the morning something phantasmal, something almost absurdly unreal, that he knew was his mortal body, went out with seven other prisoners and two guards to work on the camp roads. One day they loaded and unloaded quantities of gravel, spread it, raked it. The next day they worked with huge barrels of red-hot tar, flooding the gravel with black, shining pools of molten heat. At night, locked up in the guardhouse, he would lie without thought, without courage to compass thought, staring at the irregular beams of the ceiling overhead until about three o'clock, when he would slip into a broken, troubled sleep. During the work hours he labored with uneasy haste, attempting, as the day bore toward the sultry Mississippi sunset, to tire himself physically so that in the evening he might sleep deeply from utter exhaustion. Then one afternoon, the second week, he had a feeling that two eyes were watching him from a place a few feet beyond one of the guards. This aroused him to a sort of terror. He turned his back on the eyes and shoveled feverishly until it became necessary for him to face about and go for more gravel. Then they entered his vision again, and his already taut nerves tightened up to the breaking point. The eyes were leering at him. Out of a hot silence he heard his name called in a tragic voice, and the earth tipped absurdly back and forth to a babble of shouting and confusion. When next he became conscious, he was back in the guardhouse, and the other prisoners were throwing him curious glances. The eyes returned no more. It was many days before he realized, the voice must have been Dot's, that she had called out to him and made some sort of disturbance. He decided this just previous to the expiration of his sentence, when the cloud that oppressed him had lifted, leaving him in a deep, dispirited lethargy. As the conscious mediator, the monitor who kept that fearsome melange of horror grew stronger, Anthony became physically weaker. He was scarcely able to get through the two days of toil, and when he was released one rainy afternoon, and returned to his company, he reached his tent only to fall into a heavy doze, from which he awoke before dawn, aching and unrefreshed. Beside his cot were two letters that had been awaiting him in the orderly tent for some time. The first was from Gloria. It was short and cool. The case is coming to trial late in November. Can you possibly get leave? I've tried to write you again and again, but it just seems to make things worse. I want to see you about several matters, but you know that you have once prevented me from coming, and I am disinclined to try again. In view of a number of things, it seems necessary that we have a conference. I'm very glad about your appointment. Gloria. He was too tired to try to understand, or to care. Her phrases, her intentions, were all very far away in an incomprehensible past. At the second letter he scarcely glanced. It was from Dot, an incoherent, tear-swollen scrawl, a flood of protest, endearment, and grief. After a pause he let it slip from his inert hand and drowsed back into a nebulous hinterland of his own. At drill call he awoke with a high fever and fainted when he tried to leave his tent. At noon he was sent to the base hospital with influenza. He was aware that this sickness was providential. It saved him from a hysterical relapse, and he recovered in time to entrain on a damp November day for New York and for the interminable massacre beyond. When the regiment reached Camp Mills, Long Island, Anthony's single idea was to get into the city and see Gloria as soon as possible. It was now evident that an armistice would be signed within the week, but rumor had it that, in any case, troops would continue to be shipped to France until the last moment. Anthony was appalled at the notion of the long voyage, of the tedious debarkation at a French port, of being kept abroad for a year, possibly, to replace the troops who had seen actual fighting. His intention had been to obtain a two-day furlough, but Camp Mills proved to be under a strict influenza quarantine. It was impossible for even an officer to leave except on official business. For a private, it was out of the question. The camp itself was a dreary muddle, cold, windswept, and filthy, with the accumulated dirt incident to the passage through of many divisions. Their train came in at seven one night, and they waited in line until one, while a military tangle was straightened out somewhere ahead. Officers ran up and down ceaselessly, calling orders and making a great uproar. 
it turned out that the trouble was due to the colonel who was in a righteous temper because he was a west pointer and the war was going to stop before he could get overseas had the militant governments realized the number of broken hearts among the older west pointers during that week they would indubitably have prolonged the slaughter another month the thing was pitiable gazing out at the bleak expanse of tents extending for miles over a trodden welter of slush and snow Anthony saw the impracticality of trudging to a telephone that night. He would call her at the first opportunity in the morning. Aroused in the chill and bitter dawn, he stood at Reveille and listened to a passionate harangue from Captain Dunning. "'You men may think the war is over. Well, let me tell you, it isn't. Those fellows aren't going to go sign the armistice. It's another trick, and we'd be crazy to let anything slacken up here in the company because, let me tell you, we're going to sail from here within a week.' and when we do we're going to see some real fighting he paused that they might get the full effect of his pronouncement and then if you think the war's over just talk to anyone who's been in it and see if they think the germans are all in they don't nobody does i've talked to the people that know and they say there'll be anyways a year longer of war they don't think it's over so you men better not get any foolish ideas that it is doubly stressing this final admonition he ordered the company dismissed at noon, Anthony set off at a run for the nearest canteen telephone. As he approached what corresponded to the downtown of the camp, he noticed that many other soldiers were running also, that a man near him had suddenly leaped into the air and clicked his heels together. The tendency to run became general, and from little excited groups here and there came the sounds of cheering. He stopped and listened. Over the cold country, Whistles were blowing, and the chimes of the Garden City churches broke suddenly into reverberatory sound. Anthony began to run again. The cries were clear and distinct now as they rose with clouds of frosted breath into the chilly air. Germany surrendered! Germany surrendered! The False Armistice That evening, in the opaque gloom of six o'clock, Anthony slipped between two freight cars, and once over the railroad followed the track along to Garden City, where he caught an electric train for New York. He stood some chance of apprehension. He knew that the military police were often sent through the cars to ask for passes, but he imagined that tonight the vigilance would be relaxed. But in any event he would have tried to slip through, for he had been unable to locate Gloria by telephone, and another day of suspense would have been intolerable. After inexplicable stops and waits that reminded him of the night he had left New York over a year before, they drew into the Pennsylvania station, and he followed the familiar way to the taxi stand, finding it grotesque and oddly stimulating to give his own address. Broadway was a riot of light, thronged as he had never seen it with a carnival crowd, which swept its glittering way through scraps of paper piled ankle-deep on the sidewalks. Here and there, elevated upon benches and boxes, soldiers addressed the heedless mass each face in which was clear-cut and distinct under the white glare overhead anthony picked out half a dozen figures a drunken sailor tipped backward and supported by two other gobs was waving his hat and emitting a wild series of roars a wounded soldier crutch in hand was borne along in an eddy of shoulders of some shrieking civilians a dark-haired girl sat cross-legged and meditative on top of a parked taxicab here, surely, the victory had come in time, the climax had been scheduled with the uttermost celestial foresight. The great, rich nation had made triumphant war, suffered enough for poignancy, but not enough for bitterness. Hence the carnival, the feasting, the triumph. Under these bright lights glittered the faces of peoples whose glory had long since passed away, whose very civilizations were dead, men whose ancestors had heard the news of victory in Babylon, in Nineveh, in Baghdad, in Tyre, a hundred generations before, men whose ancestors had seen a flower-decked, slave-adorned cortege drift with its wake of captives down the avenues of imperial Rome. Past the Rialto, the glittering front of the Astor, the jeweled magnificence of Times Square, a gorgeous alley of incandescence ahead, then, was it years later? He was paying the taxi driver in front of a white building on 57th Street. He was in the hall. Ah, there was the negro boy from Martinique. Lazy, indolent, unchanged. Is Mrs. Patch in? I have just come on, sir, the man announced with his incongruous British accent. 
Take me up. Then the slow drone of the elevator, the three steps to the door, which swung open at the impetus of his knock. Gloria? His voice was trembling. No answer. A faint string of smoke was rising from a cigarette tray. A number of Vanity Fair sat astraddle on the table. Gloria! He ran into the bathroom, the bath. She was not there. A negligee of robin's egg blue laid out upon the bed, diffused a faint perfume, elusive and familiar. On a chair were a pair of stockings and a street dress. An open powder box yawned upon the bureau. She must have just gone out. The telephone rang abruptly, and he started, answered it with all the sensations of an impostor. Hello, is Mrs. Patch there? No, I'm looking for her myself. Who is this? This is Mr. Crawford. This is Mr. Patch speaking. I've just arrived unexpectedly, and I don't know where to find her. Oh, Mr. Crawford sounded a bit taken aback. Why, I imagine she's at the armistice ball. I know she intended going, but I didn't think she'd leave so early. Where's the armistice ball? At the Astor. Thanks. Anthony hung up sharply and rose. Who was Mr. Crawford? And who was it that was taking her to the ball? How long had this been going on? All these questions asked and answered themselves a dozen times, a dozen ways. His very proximity to her drove him half frantic. In a frenzy of suspicion he rushed here and there about the apartment, hunting for some sign of masculine occupation, opening the bathroom cupboard, searching feverishly through the bureau drawers. Then he found something that made him stop suddenly and sit down on one of the twin beds, the corners of his mouth drooping as though he were about to weep. There, in the corner of her drawer, tied with a frail blue ribbon, were all the letters and telegrams he had written to her during the year past. He was suffused with happy and sentimental shame. "'I'm not fit to touch her,' he cried aloud to the four walls. "'I'm not fit to touch her little hand!' Nevertheless, he went out to look for her. In the Astor lobby he was engulfed immediately in a crowd so thick as to make progress almost impossible. He asked the direction of the ballroom from half a dozen people before he could get a sober and intelligible answer. Eventually, after a last long wait, he checked his military overcoat in the hall. It was only nine, but the dance was in full blast. The panorama was incredible. Women, women everywhere. Girls gay with wine, singing shrilly above the clamor of the dazzling, confetti-covered throng. Girls set off by the uniforms of a dozen nations. Fat females collapsing without dignity upon the floor, and retaining self-respect by shouting, Hurrah for the Allies! Three women with white hair, dancing hand in hand around a sailor, who revolved in a dizzying spin upon the floor, clasping to his heart an empty bottle of champagne. Breathlessly, Anthony scanned the dancers, scanned the muddled lines trailing in single file in and out among the tables, scanned the horn-blowing, kissing, coughing, laughing, drinking parties under the great full-bosomed flags which leaned in glowing color over the pageantry and the sound. Then he saw Gloria. She was sitting at a table for two directly across the room. Her dress was black, and above it her animated face tinted with the most glamorous rose, made, he thought, a spot of poignant beauty on the room. His heart leaped as though to a new music. He jostled his way toward her and called her name just as the gray eyes looked up and found him. For that instant, as their bodies met and melted, the world, the revel, the tumbling whimper of the music faded to an ecstatic monotone, hushed as a song of bees. "'Oh, my Gloria!' he cried. Her kiss was a cool rill flowing from her heart. End of Book 3, Chapter 1, Part 2 of 2